Great. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the young activists, students, and leaders that are all across the globe. My name is Sahar Mohammed Zeda. I'm a 20 year old youth explorer at National Geographic, and I'm a student at Harvard. Thank you all so much for joining us for this second session of Gen Geo Careers and Exploration, which is part of our larger summer learning series. This program is meant to emphasize National Geographic's belief that young people are truly the key to addressing the world's most pressing problems. We like to call ourselves part of Gen Geo, a community of global citizens who are thinking critically, collaborating globally, and becoming informed partners, leaders, and decision makers, and ultimately the champions of our planet. The big question is, however, how can you convert that fire and that passion that you have into a sustainable and fulfilling career? And to help continue on this journey to change the world, I'll be sharing behind the scenes look at a lot of the inspiring careers and individuals who bring National Geographic's mission to life. I'll be joined by expert scientists, educators, storytellers, all who will share their experiences, successes, and challenges that have really shaped their careers. So make sure to mark your calendars now to join National Geographic and me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So this week specifically, we are really lucky to have Kavita Gupta, an educator of over 20 years and the 2019 National Geographic Gilbert M. Grosver Education of the Year Award. I'm particularly excited for this opportunity though, because education policy, it's always had a really special place in my heart. And it's honestly one of the reasons I first started getting involved in advocacy. I first became interested in solving problems in my community in middle school when I noticed the inequities in Kentucky's education system. And honestly, it didn't take too long to realize through meetings with lawmakers and superintendents, policy experts and principals that I wasn't really being taken seriously at first. I was you know, just a kid, but thanks to many mentors, champions, and especially educators and teachers, I was able to make a difference. Right now, I think we're at a really pivotal moment where passionate young people are leading efforts across the globe to advance these science and communities in a way that's really gonna shape our community for the future. And who better really to talk to than Kavita, a chemistry teacher who not only prepares her students with the skills to enter into the workforce, but also encourages them to be you know, human beings who are optimistic about the future themselves, the future of our planet. So Kavita, thank you so, so much for joining us. Although I had the honor of briefly meeting you last year at the National Geographic Explorers Festival, it's such a pleasure to see you virtually as well. Thank you so much for that introduction. And so thrilled to be here at Gen Geo Career Chat. Welcome you all Gen Zers who are joining us live and Gen Xers and the adults who might be supporting all these Gen Zs in their quest for more knowledge in that journey, the parents, yeah. the partners, other supporters. I am so excited to talk to you in next hour over my journey as a teacher. Absolutely. Um, and we have so much fun stuff lined up to be talking about. Kavita, you've done a lot of work throughout your career focused on education, some of which was a fellow for National Geographic, but you've also taught science nationwide. You've traveled to the Galapagos, and now you're even supporting students through the Youth Climate Summit. Needless to say, you have a lot of experience that I can't wait to learn from. Would you be so kind to take the time to tell us about your experiences? You know, what does your work look like? And at the end of the day, how are you ultimately changing the world? Absolutely, Sahar. So excited to share that. But let me start by sharing my screen so I can share some pictures as I'm talking about my work. So here goes. And let me get on the present mode. There we go. So you see on the top left is my classroom. That is my sphere of influence. That's where I get to engage with these bright young minds, 150 every year, and work with them. And I never thought when I started my educational journey about 25 years ago that my sphere of influence will go beyond my classroom to a national stage with National Geographic and that I will be featured in their documentary as well. What an honor and what a growth for me. So I want to 
share with you how I started as a classroom teacher and what I'm doing today. So as a high school teacher, I have a gift of working with students at a special junction in their lives. They are at the crossroads of adulthood where students want to learn. And you who are joining us, the Gen Zs, you want to learn about the issues of your time, like climate change, like other big issues. And not only you want to learn, but you want to have a seat at the table that makes decisions for your future. And you are also developing your worldview and you are developing your views around your career. You've started to explore what's next beyond high school, what majors may I be taking and so on. And you, my friends, and the other young ones that I have the privilege to work with, I see so much potential for our future in you that throughout my educational journey, I have co-designed, co-created meaningful learning experiences for my students so they can connect with their peers worldwide to shape these attitudes better and that they have a voice and choice in their learning. Sounds easy breezy, right? Well, not quite. This journey wasn't as linear as it seems, but you put one step ahead of other and it all happens. And all this work is rooted in two beliefs that I have. My first belief is the young students and Gen Zs like you, you want the education to mean more than the bookish knowledge. You want education to be a means to make sense of the world that you live in. in. My second belief is the role of teacher is changing. So that teacher learner role is switched between students and teacher all the time. Sometimes I learn from my students and sometimes I teach them. And hence we have a collective community of learners. And this is how I have been able to engage students in empowering and elevating their voice. And I'm gonna share some of those with you today during this presentation. So about 10 or so years ago, I really started questioning the goal of education. See, as a trained chemistry teacher, I thought if I made learning fun and they understood chemistry, my job is done. But about 10 years or so ago, I said, no, that is not enough. Because when I started asking questions of my students about climate change, plastic pollutions, they had very little database scientific understanding. They had heard about these things from someone else, but they didn't know for themselves if they were facts or not. And I thought it was my responsibility, even as a chemistry teacher, to teach them about these big issues like climate change through the lens of chemistry. But there was one problem. Problem was, I was a trained chemistry teacher. I knew how to teach chemistry, but I didn't have skills or enough understanding to teach climate change. So I turned to the best and I go to National Geographic to get a certification so I can get tools and resources to address this topic. And that was, a life-changing experience for me. And as part of that journey, I went to an expedition to Galapagos and I learned so much and came back a changed educator from that experience. And here I'm gonna share a moment with you that was pivotal. This picture you see here, I was just sitting on a rock and a baby sea lion came within two feet, a foot and a half of me and sat there for like five to seven minutes. I didn't even have this picture was clicked by someone who ran to get their big lens camera and click the picture. Somebody dropped it for me. I didn't have it. For me, this moment signifies the pivotal change in me that brought urgency to climate education. When I sat so close to this baby sea lion, saw its eye movement, saw its skin move, I swear we had a heart to heart. 
And I thought these invaluable experiences will not exist if I don't go back to my classroom and educate my students about issues such as climate change, plastic pollution. So I started teaching chemistry. I was still teaching chemistry. I started teaching chemistry through the lens of environment. So what does that look like? I'm going to give you one example here. So in chemistry, we teach organic chemistry, right? So when we started teaching, when students started learning about organic chemistry, I brought in plastic pollution. And to my surprise, students really had an appetite to learn about it. They wanted me to take them to a recycling plant to really see how plastic is recycled, what all is done. So we found this lab in pretty close to us who actually invited our students to talk about upcycling, not only recycling, but upcycling. They ended up making a facial cleaner from plastic scraps. And now they were so inspired that they uh, organized a couple of plastic campaigns in the community. So students felt empowered and now they felt they had the knowledge to educate others in the community. So they went and organized these uh, campaigns and even educated a small Girl Scout troop about collecting plastic. These students got so much positive learning out of it as well because these young girls saw them as their heroes. They developed leadership skills. They found a meaning to their learning. And now that they saw when they have a voice and choice in their learning, the learning is so authentic. They wanted to form a club. We didn't have an environmental science club. So a group of students approached me and asked me to be a mentor for the environmental science club. So this was entirely student-driven initiative. I do bring the mentor perspective, but students decide what they want to do, what they want to learn, what would the meetings look like, what projects they want to do. And I'm highlighting some of the projects and these are very few and they do a lot of work. So on the left is a group of two girls. So they one day noticed in their yard that there was a particular bush by which a bunch of honeybees would die. And this was unusual. And this led them to thinking, are there plants that are conducive for honeybee growth and plants that deter it? And their research led them to developing this app, Be Aware, where if you or I wanted to plant something in my yard and wanted to do right by honeybees, we can just put our zip code and it'll tell us what plants we should be planting. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, look at the right, this was yet another girl who learned after learning about climate change wanted to express it artistically. So they have shown the effect of climate change. And on top you see of the earth is that young voice, Greta Thunberg, who says, how dare you? This is our planet. And they wanted to organize a big event for Earth Day where all the students action researches will be presented I want to bring an important point here. In none of this was my voice anywhere. My role was to bring resources and create that beautiful workspace where students can elevate their voice and express their views and what they learn. And they organized a virtual Earth Day. And we know what starts early on in high school, this kind of empowerment around their action research is so addictive. It continues on in college. And I have heard from so many alumni, this is one who from get-go, from freshman year, seek research opportunities around environmental sustainability things. And she worked on a solar cooker and she is still continuing on that path. She graduated from college this year. Now that the students saw what power there is and engagement there is when they learn about the issues of their time where the content is a vehicle to get to that end. They wanted to do more. And we started doing a year end project around climate change where students will pick a topic, research it and present it in the medium of their choice. There was only one little problem. The little problem was their friends who were not taking my class or who were not taking science 
they were maybe taking social studies or in arts, they also wanted to participate. So I approached other teachers if they will be willing to participate. And to my surprise, there were about 25 teachers who wanted their students to take part in this action research and then present it. And we called this event where students presented their action research, the Earth Deconstructed. And there were over 500 attendees. We were only limited by space. We had to turn so many back. There were 200 student presenters who shared their research either in form of a artwork or music or drama or photo or app development to the community. Generally around science projects, students don't want their families or other friends coming because it's very nerdy this was a cool event where they were like oh come see what we learned and you know they got such positive feedback from the community and from scientists who looked at their action research and told them oh my god this is amazing they felt so validated in their learning i heard so many comments like this is one high school experience i'll never forget i'm going to take it with me in my life today changed my future path to Oh, Mrs. Gupta, I'm so smart, you know. And now that youth found that this is so powerful to work with their peers, to learn with each other, to see that commonality in their understanding of things. They wanted to go bigger their own, than their own high school. So we organized a youth board who organized a youth climate action summit for the entire Bay Area. So this big old line you see, this is not Ariana Grande's concert, but this is youth lining up an hour before doors were to open to learn about climate change. Need I say more that they want to have a voice and a choice and they want to learn about the issues of their time. And this event was amazing because students shared their research. They also learned from um, subject matter experts like Dr. Bob Bellard, who discovered Titanic. So on the left, you see a picture. He talked live with the student from his expedition ship Nautilus. That was such a treat for the students. In the middle picture, students from Galapagos, Florida and Silicon Valley are talking to each other live about the research, about their own action research. So Galapagos students were sharing how they are experiencing the impact of warmer climates. Like one of the students action research was on their island, a particular berry doesn't grow anymore, which impacts the bird and other population, but their grandma's island, it still grows because their island is getting warmer. So when youth interact with each other and hear from each other, that learning is lasting. And inspired by this event to the right, you see a picture. Now a group of students from Florida wanted to do an action summit and they did. So what I want to say here is there is so much promise in you, Gen Z's, you can do it. It ain't gonna be easy, but you have resources and support. And the question that I get asked often is why do I do this? Like I'm a full-time teacher, do, am I not busy enough? Yes, I am, but this work is so close to my heart. I'm so passionate about it. When you're really passionate about the work, you find time. And why am I so passionate about it? Because this is my future, this is your future. In this slide are so many stories from my alumni that I see time to time who come and pay a visit, share their life stories. So in the bottom middle, I was speaking at Silicon Valley March for Science. There were like five, 6,000 people here. And I see this placard with a student who I hadn't seen in 10 years. Ms. Gupta taught me chemistry. It soared my spirits. To the right bottom is a student who after graduating and developing early love for research is now working on autonomous vehicles. In here is a story of a student who has raised funds with a very prestigious university for developing, for promoting social emotional growth for teenagers. And in this slide are so many more stories that I'd love to share, but I think Sahar is looking at me and my time is up now. So I'm going to leave it here. The gist of it is 
I believe that you are our future. I also believe I shouldn't leave all the problems to you to solve on your own. Hey, I've gone the earth and now you take care of it. I want to give you the skills and tools so that you can do what you want to do in the future. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Kavita, thank you so much. That is, for me personally, absolutely inspirational. And I'm sure it is to all the people that are watching as well. I just think it's so motivating to learn about the many ways that you have devoted yourself to this field of study, to the international impact that you've had, and most importantly, to the ways you've empowered others to join your cause. And before we hop into our discussion, because I have so many questions, I would love to hear from those that are joining internationally as well. Kavit and I would love to hear what you're thinking. So share your thoughts by tagging at Nat Geo Education or use the hashtag, hashtag GenGeo on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, whatever social platform that you prefer. And be sure to submit any questions you have for us to the chat bar on the YouTube live, and we will address them as they're submitted. So Kavita, I think it would be an understatement to say that I was thrilled to hear that you were joining us today. Um, personally, I've always known that I wanted to be involved in education in some capacity. You know, since eighth grade, um, I really wanted to learn more about this topic. What was the realization that you had that you wanted to be an educator? Did you have an aha moment? Was it developed over time? Or was it a pivotal moment? And can you talk about that decision? Such a nice question, Sahar. So I will tell you very honestly, my first recollections of my childhood and as my mom and dad tell me, and that is way before when dinosaurs roamed the earth. So I'm pretty old now, but I'm kidding. Um, my first recollections are I'm gathering neighborhood kids and playing teacher. And guess who was the teacher always? That was me. So I had being a teacher in me from very early on. But my career path took me different place. So I did my master's in biochemistry. I was working in a research lab in 80s when it was like uh, when we were mapping the genome, human genome project was on and so on. And I loved my work. I loved scientific inquiry, but I'm more social person. I felt little isolated in my lab and I knew I needed to change the career. And around that time in my, um, I would say early twenties is when I decided to change my career and I decided to become a teacher. And I also had my first child who is 30 now and um, teaching it was since then and never a day when I have looked back and I'm so glad I get paid for it because I would be a teacher whether I'm paid or not. Oh my goodness, that's such a lovely re response to hear. And another question to follow up with that, I think also throughout my childhood, the only career paths that were really evident to me in the field of education was either to be a teacher, a principal or superintendent, or if we were being really creative, maybe I could be a policymaker in the field of education. But I mean, your experience clearly shows that there's so many pathways within the field of education. Um, do you think that we've historically been portraying education too narrowly? And in what ways is it more interdisciplinary than we conventionally are led to believe? And I would agree with you that our definition of education is very narrow. If you ask someone to close their eyes and say what teaching is, you'll see a teacher on the front board and a bunch of students and straight desk. Well, education is anything but. Well, there are still parts where that is the model of education, but education has so much to offer. But for that, we need to co-create, co-design, and give students a voice in their learning rather than the teacher saying that this is what is prescribed, this is what you will learn. We need to bring them along as a party about what they are interested in learning and that's where the shifts happen. So most of my shifts happen because I made that shift. Talking about interdisciplinary, that's such a good point you bring up, Sahar. When I was being trained as a teacher, the primary mode was you're a physics teacher, a chemistry teacher, an English teacher. But in today's world, interdisciplinary is the way to go. Let me give you an example. So let's say you are an emergency room doctor, right? And a patient comes in a critical condition. 
your role is to save the patient. It doesn't matter whether you learn physiology or muscle chemistry or neuroscience, you need to bring all your learning together to make that patient survive. Similarly in education, today so much focus is on solving the problems which oftentimes cannot be solved by one discipline. So interdisciplinary problem solving approach is the way to go. No, absolutely. And what do you think are some of the skills for you personally that have come up as you're addressing each individual child and their needs? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that as each student comes in, um, it's really difficult to be addressing each one of them individually, trying to adhere to every patient as to continue your metaphor. Um, what are some of the best skills and strategies that you've practiced? I think for me, the most important skill is a research skill. And I think it's going to become more and more important with distance learning, with so much available on the internet. How do you separate fake news from real news? How do you separate less than authentic data to scientific data? For example, the other day I was doing a research, is a glass of red wine good for me? So I did a research, is a glass of red wine good for me? I had like 100 hits, very authentic looking. And then my research question changed, is a glass of wine not good for you? And then there were 100 hits, very authentic looking. So for you, Gen Z's, you will have to make so many of those decisions, whether it's your health or whether you're a consumer or whether you're just buying a product, right? A beauty product, a cosmetic. I mean, is it worth paying all the money? So being able to understand the data and analysis of that, and I lump them all under the big umbrella of research skills. And I think that is going to be on the forefront of the skills you will need. Oh, that is, I could not agree more. And I think you've um, touched on a point that I want to dig into a little bit deeper. You've worked with you know, hundreds of young people and students in your classrooms. And one attribution I would love to take the time to first praise you on is your ability to support and uplift your students as partners. Um, in my experience and in the narratives of so many students I've talked to, it's often that teachers um, that light that initial spark and plant the seed of innovation and motivation in their students, it's really difficult to do that. But, you know, it might at times be rewarding as well. It's just traditionally a balance to find that authoritative figure in the classroom, but also a co-creator and a motivator. How do you find that balance between the traditional outpoints of teachers and viewing students as partners? That's an awesome question. And I cannot say that that was easy because the traditional image of a teacher is sage on the stage. I know where you need to go. I will take you there. Just follow everything I say. And students were often disengaged. You know, for me, it came from experience. I would turn off the lights and have the PowerPoint on and my students will start sleeping. Like they're trying to really keep awake, but they start nodding and I said, this ain't working. And I started shifting the model little by little. And I saw as I gave them more choice and more voice where they were coming up with questions, I still had the learning objectives very clearly planned. I saw that it enriched the learning and engagement of student was so much more. So for me, it was a little experiment. And through positive enforcement, I kind of totally shifted. But I can see how it can be scary for some teachers to go from sage on the stage to guide by the side. But once you become guide by the side, it is amazing things you can do. Because honestly, Sahar, I couldn't have done any of this without the students brainstorming without their ideas, without their initiative, without their understanding of things. So once you make them co-collaborators, it really elevates the learning to a level where I couldn't even imagine going by myself. I love how you're illustrating that concept of co-collaboration. If I were to step into your classroom you know, right now, what would that look like and in a very real and tangible basis? Would you ask me what I want the test to be on, what I want to study today, what types of labs I want to engage in, what would that look like if I was your student? 
So I would start with some, so I will have to do some background work as a teacher. So I will look, okay, what am I asked by my state to teach? Because that is the reality in life of the teachers. So I can be teaching anything. So I will see, and then what I try and do before is I map out some of the issues that we call phenomena now that are happening in our community, in our nation, in our world. And that is that hook to hook them in. So I will first show them that phenomena or that issue or that problem, and then leave space open for student questioning in small groups, in larger groups. What do you, what are you observing here? What do you wonder about? What could be a question that we all could focus on? And from that question comes a sequence of lessons which are always, if I can give an analogy, student is on the driver's seat, I have the second wheel. So they will say that, oh, you know, why is this happening? What can I learn? So then I will give them five or 10 vetted resources. You can learn from here. And then we have a discussion about what are we learning? And they are interacting peer to peer as much as they're doing individually. Now you're making me want to go back to high school just so I can sit in on one of your classrooms and experience that. Um, but moving on a little bit more towards global careers, and I, we touched on it, said so becoming increasingly interdisciplinary, um, and your experience as a teacher illustrates that evolution from being in the classroom to the Galapagos to doing all this work as a fellow. Um, what do you think is an important skill that students should have throughout their careers, regardless of what they are and what they're teaching? And what do you think that shows about flexibility of careers and being adaptable? So I can tell you one thing, that career path is not straight. There must be less than one or 2% of population who know in kindergarten they want to be doctors and they end up being doctors. But if you talk to most adults in your life, you'll realize the path was zigzag. They decided they were gonna go this way and then they moved here and this opportunity led them to this. So career paths are very non-linear. You, my biggest advice to you Gen Zs would be keep your options open. Go into it, into the college, not knowing your major. That's great. When a student comes to me and say, Mrs. Gupta, I just don't know what I'm going to do in college. I said, that is great because that's what opens your mind to world of possibilities. There are so many majors that are offered in college that high schoolers don't even know exist. So how can you make up your mind? Be curious, look around, have a passion for learning. Whatever life teaches you, just soak it up. It'll take you somewhere. You know, just keeping a broad base and open mind. Don't narrow and box yourself too much early on because it may take away from something that you can be tomorrow. And don't let that one bad experience or a bad teacher or a bad grade turn you off from something thinking, oh, I can't do chemistry. I'm not good at chemistry. I don't understand statements like that. Yes, you can. You just need... Some more time, a little bit, keep a growth mindset with a yet at the end of sentences. I can do it yet, changes the whole framework of thinking. I love that. And that's something maybe I should start embodying as well as embracing the ambiguity and, and being really comfortable with exploring continuously new options. And with that, you know, you've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different experiences as well. Um, you're working in countries internationally. And I think that you've seen different countries enough to kind of start understanding the way that different countries might treat the teaching profession and education field differently than they might in the US, whether it be through how teachers are viewed in society, funding, any other factors. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about those discrepancies between nations and their view on education? And how do you think we can improve the field of education here in the US? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've had the benefit of closely experiencing two systems. So I grew up in India till the age of about 23. And then since then I've been in America where I've taken many classes and I've been an educator here. And yes, there are differences. And according to a recent credible poll in America, teachers are not as respected, actually are much lower in respect than some of the other countries as well. And in terms of teacher salaries, we don't rank to the top either. And 
we need to decide where is our future of country. Our future of country really is in teaching profession because teaching profession is the profession that makes all other professions. Teachers, teaching profession makes engineers, they make doctors, they make architects, they make humanitarians, right? So we need to make the profession such that the top 5% of a graduating class wants to be a teacher. There is fight over being a teacher. And that is when we can really attract talent and inspire this next generation to do wonders. And are we there in America? No, I think we can do better in both realms in respect and in um, uh, teacher salaries. But um, that is an area for us to grow in more. No, I, I think that's a really, really interesting point that you made. Um, it's really about changing the narrative and addressing the really critical role that teachers do bring to the platform and not just the field of education, but all throughout different careers. Um, so Kavita, if you could address the people that are watching right now and you know, give them your pitch and your idea on why they should be a teacher, you know, what is something that you would say to them? What is something that made you choose teaching and why do you think others should go into this profession as well? Why do you wake up every morning excited for the classroom? You know, there are very, very few professions where you can truly make a difference in someone's life, in the future of your country, in the future of humanity. And teaching is one of those professions. And we do need quality teachers. And we need teachers with heart and passion and perspective and for educating this Gen Z that is so bright, has so many ideas, so cutting edge. We need fresh blood. We need teachers with vision and ideas and let's go do it. So please consider teaching as a viable option. It'll fill your heart. As I tell the new teachers, every night you will feel so tired. You'll drop on your bed and just crash out, but you will sleep with your heart full every night. No, and, and I think that the, 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 you addressed a little bit of this, but if we're going to talk about the benefits that come with changing the world, I think it's also critical to talk about some of the challenges and obstacles you might have faced yes. there. You know, along your career journey, what do you think has been some of the most challenging things that you've had to overcome? And what were the most important things that you had to utilize in terms of resources or skills to overcome those roadblocks? I think the biggest thing is unlike private company and I live in Silicon Valley. So I see many startups, I see many private uh, organizations where the speed of change is very fast, where an idea comes and there's a lot of support in terms of time and money and resources to launch that idea and take it forward. I think in education, it is a big machinery. So things happen at a slower pace. So that is one. The second bigger challenge is how do some of the activities or experience that might be very meaningful for students if they don't align with the state education vision or your school's vision? How do you still get support and funding and create time to make those happen? And lastly, how do you bring more educators and people along in this? if there is no reward other than just doing right by the young minds and right by the earth. So those are some challenges that I've experienced. Wonderful. Um, what about what about doubt, um, Kavita? Like, I know that you mentioned that you are saying it's, it's really scary to make that shift from a traditional teacher at the front with a PowerPoint to a facilitator and a co-learner. Did you ever experience any doubt or hesitation when you're taking these career risks? Oh my God, every day, Sahar, every day, as I interact with students and let their minds fly, I don't know what questions are going to come out of them. And it could be that I don't know have the answers and that's a okay. So coming to terms that I'm not sage on the stage, but I'm the guide by the side who may not have all the answers, but I will explore with you. I will learn with you and from you. Also, um, Talking about feeling vulnerable, I would be lying if I said that what is going on in our country right now doesn't faze me. And I want to bring a little bit of equity, a little bit of self-awareness in my classroom. I want my students to also grow 
socially and emotionally, but I don't have skills in those areas. And I'm constantly learning. I self-doubt. I self-doubt myself. Do I have the knowledge, requisite knowledge? Do I have the skills? Should it even be part of my classroom? How would my students perceive me? Will I be able to handle a crucial conversation? So yes, doubt is there and we all feel it as long as we are okay expressing our doubts and moving forward. That is what a collaborative community is for. See, that's so reassuring. I think it's really common to have college students go in being undecided, not knowing what to do, what career they want. Um, but to hear that this is a constant process, every step of the way you're encountering a new challenge and have to understand that there's a lot of different options and you can rely on communities, on, on friends and family to ask questions and help them. Um, but you, can, you might also be able to use your own experiences to help you along the way. So let's pretend for a moment, Kavita, that you're back in high school and you're in your first year of college, you're making that pivotal transition, what advice would you give to yourself in retrospect? You know, what critical knowledge would you share with young people today? I think the first and foremost thing I would say is don't be discouraged. Things may look very big. Some of the things you want to do may seem daunting. Just start somewhere. You have a lot of support. Find that one friend. Find that one youth who thinks like you. Find that one teacher who can be your co-designer, co-collaborator. Maybe every teacher is not, but I'm sure you can find one teacher who is like that, who can give wings to your dreams and to your ideas. And by all means, dream. You know, for me, the education system I came from had everything charted out for me. If you took these courses, you go here. If you took this, you go here. And I did things almost in an auto mode, mindless. If I had to go back, I'll be so thoughtful about just learning everything because now I am, I'm learning dancing. I lift weights, I speak, I'm sitting here. So life is full of experiences. Just live life, Unamas. Experience it all, be curious keep an open mind and don't be discouraged there's always somebody who can who will be in your corner who will support you nothing is too small absolutely and, and while we're on the topic of advice you know what would you say to students that are specifically interested in a career in education um I am thankful that you're exploring this. There is so much to give. By all means, pursue it. Pursue it with a passion. Pursue it because you can make a difference. Pursue it because so many young ones are looking at you to be that teacher who can be their co-designer, co-conspirator, our partners in crime, whatever you want to call it. Oh, I love it. That, that's a wonderful response. And th those are a lot of questions that we've been having, but I also would like to take the time to ask questions from the audience. And we have members joining us from India, Colombia, domestically from Utah. Um, so we'll go ahead and start addressing some of those questions now. Uh, Sandra Tiwari asked from India, you know, um, what does it mean to you to be a National Geographic Explorer? And how does your career in education match with a lot of the things that you're doing with Nat Geo? And that's such a great question, Sanjay, if I got your name right. Um, I never thought of myself as an explorer. Explorer to me were these people whose documentaries I'll watch. They'll climb walls, they'll go under the water, they'll do all these incredible things. But in my journey with National Geographic, I realized that an educator can be explorer if I have explorer's mindset. Explorer's mindset to me as an educator means being curious in things I'm doing, trying new things in my classroom, engaging my students in new learning experiences and fostering that curiosity mindset in them. And as I have developed more in this journey, I've started thinking about different scales of the impact and different lenses and different voices and how can I empower. I am so honored to call, call myself as, edu as educator explorer. That actually is a title I never thought in my life I will have. So great question there. Wonderful. Another question. We know we talked about how the U.S. can learn from other international education systems, but on the other hand, you know, how can other countries improve on their educations in order to match up with that of developed countries like the U.S.? 
what's something that we're doing well that other people can learn from? So that is a great question. I can give a very good answer for that because I have experienced both of them. So there are skills and attitudes that traditional education systems foster that are valuable. The strength of US educational system is problem solving approach. Rather than rote memorization, the application rises to forefront. The question every time, the beginning question is, why are we learning what we are learning today? When will you ever use it in life? And if you bring that context to learning, A, students are more engaged, and the way to teach them is not, or a mode that is changing in America is not telling them factoids, but throwing a problem at them and having them use their knowledge to solve a problem. And this is called problem solving approach to teaching and learning. And I think America does a pretty good job with that. I wouldn't say this is not our growth area. We are moving in that direction, but yes, that definitely is one of the strengths of educational system here. Very well said. And I, and I think it's so exciting that you have experiences in both spheres to be able to address these conversations. Um, another question from our audience is how do you manage between classwork that you have to get through and you have to address and practical groundwork? How do you navigate between a lot of the efficiency versus creativity aspects of your classroom? Or are they even mutually exclusive to begin with? Wow, you guys are so insightful. See, this is case in point that you have it to be asking this question. So the best answer to that and best growth for personally for me has been teaching is part science and part art. And I'm talking as a science teacher. So there are scientific facts, but then there is that creativity on how you present it to the students. So they feel empowered and be part of it. For me, that has come very naturally. I start with problems and then bring them and then students fill in the gaps wherever I am lacking. But yes, we need to really merge both sides of our brain when it comes to it. If you're asking for challenge in terms of my time, I'm kind of surprised that my husband hasn't divorced me yet. Uh, there are often conversations, okay, one more thing, why are you doing it? And then I'll say, hey, this is for our future, future of our planet. So yes, time is always an issue. It seems like uh, I'm, I struggle with that a little bit, I wouldn't lie. That is why I advocate for this kind of learning and education embedded in our traditional day. So you as a student and I as a teacher don't have to scramble to find that time outside of the classroom. This is what learning is about and this should be built in the day. But I'm still fighting that. Wonderful. The next question builds off on that um, idea of time management. Um, you know, what does a day to day look like for a regular teacher? I, I think a lot of students interact with you when you're in the classroom. What does it look like a little bit behind the scenes and for you, especially as you're bringing on additional roles with National Geographic and also putting on the youth summits? What does it look like for you? What's a day? What's a day in the life of Kavita look? Like? Whoa, pretty crazy. You don't want to go there. Okay, so my day starts at about 5.45 or 6. And this is pre-COVID time. And I will wake up and my first thing is a cup of chai. Without caffeine, I'm good for nothing. And then I sit and pet my dog and have my tea. Well, I don't need to go in that detail. But from there, I'll go to school. And our school now starts around 8. So we are there on campus around 7, 7.15. One thing that students don't understand is they don't understand if, uh, if students are not at school, then what is the teacher doing? So I want you to think about teaching as an on-stage show. So for every hour of on-stage show, there's at least half an hour of backstage. I'm either preparing a lesson or I'm grading or I'm thinking, okay, what would this experience look like for students? So I'm conducting mini uh, investigations to see if it will get me the result that I want to see with my students. And then brunch happens. 
And after talking and engaging with students and facilitating this learning for two to three periods, 45 minutes or 90 minutes, then I get a brunch and I, we are all starving. So I'm eating. There is nothing like don't talk with your mouth, mouth full in teaching because I'm always talking and eating and students come and I'm asking their questions and then the bell rings and then we teach and learn together again. And then lunch happens and a bunch of kids come and we are eating on the side. So sometimes I see my husband who works in high tech their lunch time is like so serene they'll go for walks my lunch time is so exciting like i am talking to seven kids at one time i'm eating things are happening then a club comes and i connect with club members and when our traditional day is over i do support student learning through youtube so i'm doing some sessions online and after school is when I'm talking to club members. Sometimes club members will come during lunch and all other National Geographic work, Youth Climate Action Summit work is done outside of school hours. So that's on the weekends. My goodness, that is one packed schedule. I'm glad you had time to, to chat with us today. This is exciting. Um, another question that was asked from an audience member um, is how do you help your students in choosing careers um, that a lot of students face today? You know, what is a piece of advice that you give to a student that's facing a dilemma in their future careers and pathway? That's such a great question, Sahar. And I know uh, most of the high schools will have a career center where you can go learn about different options. For me personally, I feel it is a lot more useful if you invite alumni who have gone through um, the student's journey and they come back and share their learning. Oh, in high school, I used to think that STEM is the field for me, but I changed this for this reason, or I was going into engineering and now I'm not doing that. So I think alumni panels are a great way to inform students because they are very relatable and students can ask a very specific question and get very specific answer. Um, having people who are in the fields Come and talk to the students is also another great way. And we often host lunchtime panels with such um, different career people. We call them, you know, if you're a pharmacist, if you're a doctor, if you're a journalist, and we'll engage students in those conversations. But Gen Zs, you can also go out and seek those. Um, we are doing a career chat here and I'm sure National Geographic has a great resource for you to explore different careers because if you learn from your community, there are only certain types of careers that are prevalent. That's what you end up thinking about, but open your mind to that 360. There's so many different careers, so many different options available. So research, um, I'm sure there are very many resources out there, including National Geographic who can talk about various different kind of career options. Oh, absolutely. And one of our final questions from our audience members is, you know, how do you manage your lows and failures? You know, um, what is your motivation that gets you to get back up and try something again, despite, you know, not having the best day or having an extremely busy schedule or even failing a couple of times along your career path? Oh, failing is not an option. It's mandatory. It happens, right? And yes, I do hit my lows. And the thing that I always remember that someone near and dear to me told me, it doesn't matter how many times you fall down, as long as you're able to get up one more time. And this is what keeps me going. But in my really low moments, you know what I do, Sahar? And I don't think my students know this. I have done teaching for a long time. So when they give me thank you cards or their heartfelt appreciation or something, I've made a memory box. And in my low moments, I'll open them. And that is enough to bring me back to my mission and bring back my focus, why I do this work, who I do it for, and what my motivations are. And little support from my dog helps too. She is such a good listener. She always listens and makes me feel better. And I have a very loving family and my students, of course. My goodness, your passion is so infectious. Um, I'm already feeling it through the screen here. Um, let's start this conversation up with a couple of questions about the future and, and where we're going in the field of education. Now, given the impact of this pandemic and, and it has on health, on ecosystems, 
Do you have any hypotheses on the future of your work and the impact of the pandemic, not just on environments and economies, but on education? What's changed in the field due to coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, this is very um, uncharted times, unprecedented times. We haven't experienced anything like this. I think our role as educators and the goal of education really needs to change with our changing times. We do need to prepare tomorrow's workforce who will be equipped to handle these kind of pandemics. I don't think this is the first and the last ever, even though I wish for it, but we need to have systems in place. We need to um, develop tomorrow's workforce that can challenge tomorrow's challenges. And if you ask me, I think our job becomes all the more important as educators, even though our medium may change, I don't think much else will be changing. So our new normal may have us use more online tools and engage virtually, but our goal and mission will be strong and even stronger now because there is a need for more in all of these areas. And given the current situation, Kavita, what would you tell young people that are stuck at home right now? What's something that we can all do from home in order to advance our educational careers, um, our curiosity, just how do we learn and participate from home right now? And that is a very good question because many of my students have asked that question. They had this internship lined up over the summer to do this and everything is canceled. So what can I do to learn more? Not so much the content, but just, you know, what is going on in the world? And one thing, and it may sound like that I'm promoting this, but there is a challenge from National Geographic. It's called Geo Challenge. It is for... Um, there is a middle school and a high school level challenge. And in this challenge, you along with your peers, one, two, solo, whatever team you decide, you can look at a problem in your community or in your world and do research and come up with a solution and share it. And what better way to have a voice and a choice over what you want to learn, what you want to explore and share with others and get some expert opinion um, from other explorers and support staff. So I really encourage you to do a uh, geo challenge because that is what I call something over which you have control. Oh, absolutely. I think that's an incredible idea. And Kamado, one hour is just simply not enough. I could talk to you for three if you let me, but what's the best way for me to stay informed about the work that you're doing after the end of the session? And I'm going to share my screen here for one more second so I can show you my last slide with um, my contact information and you can screen capture it or uh, just remember my Twitter handle is at chem as chemistry chem underscore tweets and my email is kavita underscore gupta at fuhsd.org. And feel free to reach out to me. I love hearing from students. You will be sure to get a response. I hope that you will stay engaged and um, I hope we will get to grow together. Oh my I, I remember from last year that you're notoriously known for your chemistry puns. So I hope that your Twitter has a good portion of, of content on that. Um, but Kavita, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I'm sure you're inspiring work and advice and words of engagement. And most importantly, your personal reflections are very insightful for everyone watching, um, for me especially. So thank you again to those that are watching. Please continue sharing your thoughts by tagging at NatGeoEducation or using hashtag GenGeo on social media. If you're available this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, join the photo camp live sessions that are focused on connecting with nature, featuring photographers, Frederico Pardo and Malika Vaz. So that might be another way that we can stay engaged while we're at home. Also mark your calendars for next week, Tuesday, July 7th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. I mean, I can't believe it's July already, but join me for a discussion with Wasfia Nazri. She's a National Geographic explorer and adventurer and the only woman to hold these titles simultaneously. She's a mountaineer, a photographer, a humanitarian, and it's definitely going to be a conversation you won't want to miss. 
So until then, thank you, Katya, and everyone out there, stay curious.